But if Jim and, and, and Chris will stay up here, we're going to open up to the audience for a few minutes of questions, and then we're going to take a break. Lynn. Um, could you please? Maybe, uh, um, just so we get this recorded properly. Okay. And, and I did leave the room. Oh, sorry. Okay. I did leave the room at one point, so I hope I didn't miss your saying this, but I've heard some very scary uh, predictions as to how long uh, globally topsoil is predicted uh, to last. Can you address that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when we're looking at, you know, globally how long uh, – soil has uh, to last. And um, there are some, some really scary predictions that are out there. And there are some really scary predictions for you know how quickly we can restore soil. But all of this is dependent upon us and the measures that it is that we can take to do that. And so you know, worst, worst case scenarios, um, you know, we're going to be continuing to lose. We just have a few decades in some areas with the amount of topsoil we would have to be able to grow food. Some areas we don't have topsoil anymore to be able to grow food. Um, so it is a very scary scenario that we've got here. But again, we have a tremendous opportunity to be able to turn that around and regenerate that. And that's, I, I, I guess I'm on the side of not really talking so much about the scary stuff, but talking about the opportunities, because the opportunity exists there. And we have that tremendous potential. I'm going to ask a question about a topic I don't really know much about, but I'm always looking at the tensions between solutions. And um, right now, there's sort of the pro-GMO. It's going to save us. We're going to have a lot more plants. We've got a growing population on the earth. And we have the anti-GMO. Um, and I'm wondering how GMOs fit in with this kind of agriculture. And, or if they do. Um, well, and if Jim has things to say, I'll, I'll let him sort of chime in as well. Um, the, the GMO technology, uh, there are a lot of issues within GMO technology. And um, part of it is, is a resource allocation type of an issue. And so, again, as we look at GMO technology to address one particular type of an issue, that's an allocation of resources to address that issue without really solving the overall problem. And so, you know, we're, we're having uh, what they refer to as super weeds. Super weeds are not a new problem. Super weeds have always existed. The issue is, is that we use one solution to address our weed management issues and now we have a problem and we're going to continue to use that one solution to solve that um, for some farmers in some ways and being able to change some things within agriculture uh, there are farmers that are on various paths in which they're utilizing some gmo technology uh, to be able to get them on the path and as long as it's something that you're looking at how are we really going to be addressing the problem instead of really being at that's going to be our solution? And if, if you look at GMO as, as not a solution, but potentially as a path of needing to do something, I mean, if it's the difference between you keeping your farm and, and converting your farm eventually to a non-GMO biologically based system, or that farm getting sold to a, a corporation or someone else who's going to continue to keep it in a GMO-based system, I'm going to favor you utilizing GMO technology for a little bit to get you on the right path. The idea is always that, um, and I like to say things as issues or problems, and the idea is, is that I think we have one problem in agriculture, we don't have enough carbon in our soils. If that, you continue to look at ways in which you can address that problem, then the issues that you have are going to start going away. But if you continue to look at your issues as problems and continue to put Band-Aids on there, that's not going to solve the issue. 
right now there is drought there are drought tolerant uh, GMO crops that are out there GMO corn that's drought tolerant what they've done with that is they've changed the genes that control the stomatal opening basically the loss of water through transpiration they've done nothing to address water getting into the soil water staying on the soil the amount of precipitation that you're getting all of those types of things nothing to do with rehydrating the landscape it's all about that gene to do that that's not going to solve the issue that these guys that are again fighting over water rights and buying land just so that they can irrigate more that's not going to solve their issue to utilize drought tolerant crops that's going to perpetuate that issue Jim, with regard to the slide that you showed, uh, if we do the right thing, if we get the, uh, you have car uh, carbon levels down to 295 parts per million, when you did those projections, I'm assuming you didn't take the aerosol effect into account. I, I don't know what that is, so we'd have to talk about that in another way, yeah. Okay, well what, what that refers to is, when you have fossil fuels burning, you're creating black carbon, you're creating sulfate aerosols, which actually help to cool. And so when you take away the fossil fuels, they're estimating that in and of itself is gonna raise the temperature at least another half a degree. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, one of the things I think about is, um, I've been hearing a lot about um, the fires in uh, Canada, the fires in, uh, in Siberia you know, very early in the season, in April. And what I think about now is uh, how do we save the permafrost? Well, it may be a situation where we want to start moving north um, with things that can hydrate that land uh, or keep it hydrated or whatever. And, and the areas that get burned out might, it might, might become beaver habitat. That might become uh, some place that we want to start grazing. Uh, we don't want to let it dry out. And... Um, but as far as uh, the physics of it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning too, so. But uh, what, what is interesting to me, 50 million years ago in the Eocene, we were 10 or 12 or 14 degrees warmer than we are now. And what I thought was interesting about that, you know, we had methane spikes then and it was very dangerous for the planet. Um, and then it got colder and colder and colder and I was trying to figure out how did it get so cold? And part of it was the azola growing up there and, and making all that really deep permafrost. It's, oh, it's probably 25 feet deep of carbon-rich stuff. Um, but the other thing that happened about 10 or 15 million years ago was that the gra grasslands evolved with grazing animals. And plants could go places that used to be very, very dry. And if the animals went with them and took the poop with them, and, you know, imagine if you're in a... Um, in a herd of 100,000 animals, like let's say you're, you, all you people are in a, a buffalo herd right now, you know, and you're pooping 80 pounds, 100 pounds a day, and you're staying close together because it's safer because there's wolves about, and look at the wolves out here. <laughs> and uh, now, what's going to happen after about a day and a half in an area? You, you're going to start smelling really bad. Now, who's got the best nose in the room? You do. I'd follow her and say, where's the sweet grass? And start moving towards the sweet grass. And after a while, if you start moving in her direction, you'll, more and more of you'll smell it and you'll start moving. And it might be 20 miles away. You know? We're finding out that plants give out a language of isoprene and, and terpenes that uh, the animals used to be able to follow. But then wh what do we do? We put up barbed wire. And we lost that connection. So. Um, We've, we've got a lot to learn, but I think, uh, you know, the idea of putting down a ton of carbon per day on 20, 25 billion acres, that's something we can learn how to do in the next 50 years, and I, I just, uh, I'd root for it, so you want to add to that. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so thank you. Um, in the interest of staying on track, thank you to Jim and Chris. We're going to take a break now. Let's try to keep it to... Seven minutes, is that possible, so we can recover some time and come back and we'll have our next panel. And I'm sure Chris and Jim will be here to, uh, to answer further questions. <laughs>